As I mentioned before, uh, the science case for X-rays uh, is really centered on um, understanding complexity of uh, condensed matter and living matter. And complexity has been, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize that was just given for physics uh, uh, last year, 2021. And when we talk about complexity, we mean uh, starting from the atom, and here is uh, uh, the clear example of for a living system, a, a machine, a living machine, uh, we can say, that uh, starts uh, from the gene, from the proteins, and then all the way up uh, develops uh, to the organ and uh, to a full working body. So um, this is uh, uh, an example for life science. But uh, you can apply the same uh, the same concept in many uh, in many other areas of science like physics, uh, geoscience, uh, materials and processing, environment and sustainability. And we will hear during the day contributions in this area. I also want to mention that uh, uh, today we have around the world many synchrotron sources uh, that are referred to as uh, third generation synchrotrons. And the ESRF was the first in 1992 to launch this very, very performing uh, source that then has been developed all over the world. And today um, um, is uh, the basis of a, a very wide community that counts more than 50,000 users uh, worldwide. Uh, in 2020, meaning uh, two years ago, the ESRF has started a new kind of uh, uh, synchrotron a new machine that is referred to as EBS or fourth generation uh, synchrotron source for high energy X-rays. And this is uh, the source that uh, you will find at ESRF now and, uh, um, uh, and uh, of which I'm gonna talk uh, very, very uh, rapidly. During the last 10 years, the ESRF has um, implemented what we call the upgrade program. A first phase was completed in 2016 and delivered a new, um, um, a new uh, uh, generation of beam lines that were really um, meant to serve the science case for nanoscience, but also um, it studied the possibility of a sharp improvement in terms of performances of the X-ray source. The program was very successful because the beam lines are operational today as we speak, but uh, most importantly, this uh, first phase uh, produced um, a design, uh, an accelerator design for a new storage ring with performances that are a factor 100 better than what was possible, uh, what is possible with third generation sources. Our council supported the program and launched the phase two of our upgrade program that we refer to as EBS program. And since 2015, we have been constructing, commissioning this new source that according to plan and to budget came into operation on the 25th of August of 2020 and is now the source that you will find at the ESRF, a source with performances that today are basically a factor 100 better than anything else you can find around the world, especially in the high energy region. This is a, a snapshot of a, that shows uh, the operation of uh, ESRF with a new source uh, in August 2020. You can see here 200 milliamps, uh, you can see the topping up uh, and uh, the current that is uh, brought back to 200 milliamps at those times with a lifetime of about nine hours and basically a topping up taking place every 20 minutes. Um, we have been seeing uh, with this new source uh, features of the X-ray emission of ondulators that were not, never seen before as a demonstration of the completely different quality of this uh, uh, new EBS source, and in particular, the coherence of the X-rays that is going to be so important for imaging applications that you will see during the day. So. Today, the ESRF is again the first worldwide with this high energy synchrotron source that has been launched in 2020 and the effect is immediate. You see in green uh, around the world other sources that are developing the EBS concept and others without the green that are considering developing an upgrade or a construction according to this new lattice. So we have uh, roughly a five years lead as compared to anything else of similar that will come up into uh, the game. 
Um, what happens after one year of operation with this new source? Uh, this uh, will be shown uh, during the day for the science, but uh, for the performances of the source, you can see it here. The source is working beautifully. You see, after one year, the lifetime went from nine hours to 27 hours. The uh, topping up goes uh, uh, every hour and is only 5% loss of the overall intention. So the stability is exceptional. And if you look at the horizontal emittance, which is the parameters that has been improved by a factor of 40 as compared to the uh, previous source, is stably, stably at uh, in the range of 120 picometers when it was before four nanometers. So that's where the huge improvement in squeezing horizontally the, the source took place and allowed this increase in brightness. And as you can see also in terms of statistics, the machine availability is very close to 100% and the number of hours that they were delivered during the first year of operation are very close to, the, uh, when, uh, to those that were planned. And I just want to underline that this was all done within the COVID context uh, with a lot of difficulties uh, that we all uh, know what meant in order to operate large-scale facility and allow our users uh, to uh, use the beamline. And these are indeed the, the statistics for last year. You can see 42 out of 44 beamlines were operational. We had exceptional, uh, very good uh, uh, availability. This is the number of shifts that were delivered. This is the number of publications that came out. And uh, an important element is that uh, we quickly set up all beam lines in order to be compatible with remote access so that basically all experiments that really do not require the user know-how on site were possible uh, thanks uh, to this effort here. And about 50% of all the experiments during the COVID-19 crisis were carried out by users uh, staying uh, in their home lab. So we have uh, many challenges ahead. We have a uh, uh, plan for the construction of new beam lines. Some of them have been delayed again by the COVID crisis, but everything is reasonably well on track and they will be de delivered with a, a delay that at the most is of the order one year. Uh, we have started to deliver, for example, uh, a new stereo crystallography beam line uh, for uh, structural biology. Uh, the first beam on BM18, you will see some uh, very, very impressive uh, uh, data uh, from the uh, contribution of Paul Tafro. Uh, we got uh, first users on a completely new ultra bright uh, high pressure beam lines. And uh, also we got the first data from a high power laser facility that allows uh, uh, to study material, materials at extreme condition, thanks uh, to the possibility of having uh, a dispersive system for taking absorption spectra in a single shot. So um, uh, we have, uh, beside the beam lines, also challenges uh, in the, in, uh, for, for the coming years. We want to increase uh, the brightness, uh, the coherence, the reliability, and the stability of uh, uh, our accelerator. So we have uh, uh, a program for a new generation of undulators, uh, a fourth harmonic cavity in order to stretch the beam and get an even higher lifetime than today, improve the injection chain, and of course, all preventive maintenance that has always characterized ESRF in order to avoid having disruptions that could affect the user operation. Beside that, we have launched last year a very, very um, um, needed IT data program uh, to fully exploit uh, the information contained in the EDS data. This IT digital strategy and a new data centers will be implemented uh, adiabatically over the coming years in order to improve uh, and uh, make available to our users a uh, computing infrastructures that will enable online data analysis, uh, long-term data storage, open access to the data, use of the European Open Science Cloud, and so on and so forth. One word about uh, industry at the ESRF. You can see that many areas of industry are, uh, are uh, 
using the ESRF in a very effective way, and we will have a contribution from the business development office that will tell you more on how ESRF can access and exploit ESRF. So um, we are uh, really aiming at becoming to become a driver for European science. Uh, we have a, a science program and all our instruments are aligned to develop that program that uh, reflects very well the uh, um, uh, Horizon Europe framework program. So this is also in view to facilitate all our users to access our facilities in aligning their program with the um, European Commission program. Also, uh, we are very much aligned with the sustainable development goals of UNESCO. I've seen uh, that just next door, there is an ongoing an, uh, an, uh, uh, a conference uh, on uh, voluntaries in which the sustainable goals are dis uh, discussed in a completely different framework. So this gives you the importance also on how we can connect with the communities which are not necessarily only science as of today. Um, I cannot resist just to say that this is an extremely impressive result that was uh, the first result of uh, EBS science. Paul will talk much more about it, Paul Tafaro. Uh, they published a paper on nature methods in November. This is an article that as of today has something like 73,000 article access is uh, uh, ranked first of 83 track articles of a similar age in uh, nature methods and uh, 200 out of the 420,000 track articles on all journals uh, ever uh, published in, 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 in human history. And, and also this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this program that is on um, uh, uh, subcellular imaging of a full U human organs. So this is a, 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 a lung of a patient that died by COVID-19, allowed to see features uh, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the organ that are absolutely uh, incredible. This is a, a collaboration between uh, the ESRF, uh, the University College Lo uh, London, a team of uh, German um, um, hospital, and is supported by the Chun, Chan Zuckerberg initiative. So um, this has also in, uh, introduced uh, the possibility of launching a human organ atlas project, but Paul will talk about it. So uh, finally, one word about uh, education. So ESRF supports an international program for PhD. We have something like between 40 and 60 uh, PhD program going uh, on at the ESRF, as well as postdoctoral fellows program. We have something between 60 and 80. This depends. The small numbers are the institutional position. The large number are those that benefit from grants, typically from the European Union. And like, for example, one that is going on today, which is a Marie Curie program. In fact, is a co-funded program. Uh, again, I don't want to go uh, too much into the details because of reasons of time, but it's a program that is quite unique because uh, um, it brings uh, together uh, 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 X-ray and neutron science with industry needs. And in fact, the characteristic of this PhD program is that they require an industrial partner and the use of X-rays and neutrons, and is funding 40 PhD positions, and is being very, very uh, successful. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I think it's really an exciting time to uh, use the ESRF with this new source, unique worldwide, with a lot of instruments that have been built over a 10 years period to be adapted to that, uh, to that source. Um, um, uh, uh, now, Gemma will, uh, uh, Director of Research, Gemma Martinez Criado, will tell you much more about uh, this, uh, this, this instrument. And uh, with that, I really wish uh, uh, to thank you for uh, your attention. And I look forward to seeing you uh, uh, at the ESRF very soon. So, thank you.
Thanks, Simsko, for this brilliant overview of the facility. Uh, are there any questions? We'll start from the audience here. Well, this was a breaking of the ice. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. It's really a great pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the, everyone and especially the local committee or the city committee for the splendid work. It has been really amazing. And I hope that we will get uh, our final outcome soon. So I want to talk today about the use of the extremely brilliant source, especially for uh, condensed matter, material science and physical science. And in that context, let me see. Uh, you will, I, I will just repeat some things that actually was introduced by Francesco already. So uh, as part of the phase two upgrade program of the SRF, uh, we have a really outstanding uh, source based on, on the development of the heat and hybrid uh, uh, multi-vent achromatic lattices. But apart from that, as as part of the upgrade project, we have also the development of a unique brand new flagship B lines, uh, EVS1 for coiling applications, ID18, uh, the long B line, the hard X ray, diffraction B line, EVS2 for um, uh, X ray diffraction microscopy. So uh, that actually would profit from, from the development of a um, High time rate detectors and integration detectors for diffraction and, and, and scattering. Also, we have a IT program for the managing and handling. Okay, let's go back to the. Okay. So a full exploitation that needs, given the high uh, throughput detector, we need a very important uh, program on data visualization, real time, uh, uh, real time data analysis. So in that context, while well, the numbers are by far uh, impressive, we have a, a gain in, in transfer coherence by a factor of 30, 100 in emittance, billions, and right now, as Francesco said, even 20, 21, 22, 27 hours of lifetime. So this is the, the machine. So as a, a experiment division, we profit from it quite a lot. Instead of being size from nanometers to half a meter, what is very important for large field of view, we have some uh, comments there in the middle of the screen, sorry. Then greater coherence for CDI and phase contrast tomography, superior photon hunger techniques, higher energies for higher flux, uh, higher throughput with those tolerance, better sensitivity and lower noise. So at the level of the experiment division, there's a big impact on, on, on the implementation of the EVS. We come back again. We will be because So, so we have a portfolio of demands. Uh, most, some of them we are already uh, upgraded. Let's say during the phase one of the upgrade program, and right now we are uh, running a very ambitious program of uh, reform these demands plus EVS or demands, as I mentioned before, and this. Everything covers different areas. As you see, if we can group uh, according to techniques, so we find four big groups absorption, diffraction, scattering, and emitting big lines. I try to speed it up because we have just uh, lose some time. And in general, we group them into two big areas what we call physical science and life science. The physical science, as you see, the structure of material. I mean, deals with the structure of material, with electronic, stru uh, electronic structure, magnetism, dynamic group, and matter aggregate conditions. So I'm going to concentrate my talk in some scientific cases that uh, belongs to the physical science. However, later on, my colleague, Annalisa Pastore, will present the, the, the one for, for life science, right? So in the physical science, we uh, basically have three big group, groups, and the field of applications they range from materials engineering, solid state physics, chemistry, medicine, material science, geology, environmental science, archaeology, and paleontology. So today we are going to see some cases coming from scientists from different bin lines. And uh, in general, all of them profit 
in the same way, let's say more or less the same way from the EVM. So we can go to multi-scale, or nanometer, well, even meters, in the case of BM18, one of the upgrade villains, pump proof experiment, time resolution, condition extreme in situ, over under many thermodynamical conditions, better capabilities, and even machine learning algorithms to treat uh, the data. And in that context, our uh, research actually they cover not only, uh, let's say, many scales, but if we have a look, for instance, within the, the agriculture and food security uh, areas, we see that we can go from the toxicity uh, cases and to the soils, I mean, uh, uh, contaminations, to study the uptake of nutrients, nutrients in, 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 in plants. Also, the biomineralization process by via bacteria in soils, we cover also the a large range of the scales in, in, in life science. I mean, from organos to study, for instance, neurons for degenerative disease like Parkinson, uh, Alzheimer, toward, uh, as Francesco already saw, uh, showed the COVID case of the lung in, uh, by micro CT uh, techniques. So the same applies to material science. I mean, uh, material processing, what we have a Big activity on, on storage, I mean, energy, degradation mechanism, switching, storing, anything uh, that actually affects the, 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 the device uh, operation. Also, the, in, in material processing, we can, let's say, track uh, reactions, formation of defects, cracks, microstructural uh, interactions, corrosion effects, damage, largely. Uh, uh, in, in a large in the range that the change from, from the nanometer up to the micro scales. And finally, fundamental science for TUA, we cover uh, atomic scale, microstructures, and even a uh, larger scale. So uh, the examples I'm going to tell you today, some of them, they have to do with a uh, geology, with a uh, from materials or geoscience, we are mean uh, we are studying uh, with high pressure and high temperatures the behavior of, of materials of the, the interior of, of planets. We also have many uh, activities going on in geology. I mean, either thermal processes, the, the, the formation of planets and, and so on. So in that context, I'm just going to present three cases coming from ID3. It's a big line for hard X-ray microscopy. Uh, Basically, as you see here, there is a lens, a CRL, that generates a real space image using the diffracted uh, beam as illumination. Um, the goal of this beam is just to go for multi-scale uh, 3D mapping. And the technique that is behind the, the main uh, goal is star field X-ray microscopy, microscopy for internal orientations. Here you see two images, uh, lattice orientation of a grain invariant titanate, and you can actually observe the different microstructure interrelation between the domain cluster within the grain. So this is a quite in very, uh, how can I say, a fractured beam line because uh, the, the, the large amount, I mean, of, sorry, capabilities in terms of energy, in terms of, of uh, spatial resolution, strain sensitivity and, and beam size. And uh, the beam line applied to metals, ceramics, minerals, biomaterials. And as an example, I decided to show you the case of the magnesium alloys, which are a super light uh, weight alloys. They have the same strength as a steel, but it is 10 times lighter. And it's a improvement uh, for the uh, fuel efficiency more sustainable and environmental friendly. And the idea, the key questions that we want to answer, as you see in the automobile uh, industry, it is has the magnesium alloys is using very uh, many elements from the, from the cars. And the idea is whether we can improve the alloy properties to, to get uh, the same strength with less problems, let's say more machinable, so less uh, breathless. And the, to target this problem to the improvement of the, of, the, of the magnesium alloys, what we have done at the SRF is uh, to take part of the manufacturing process called heat treatment in situ by using the uh, ID3 and in, uh, hard X-ray uh, 
microscopy. Uh, the goal was to, to, to try to correlate the microstructure, never, uh, let's say, structural uh, information with the mechanical behavior. And that's what this has been done here. The data is still in process, but you see as a function of the annealing temperature and the time, the, the behavior of the grains, and on the upper part, how the, the, the microstructure behaves with time and temperature. So uh, this is one case of the operand activities of the hard X-ray microscopy bin line. This is as part of the high power facility, which actually is based on laser shot compressions, dynamic compression. And uh, the idea is just to uh, use a laser, very powerful laser, 50 joules. It's gonna be uh, upgraded to 100 joule in this uh, 2022. And uh, the is operational, as Francesco already uh, introduced, the, the, the high power laser facility already calibrated the, the, the working principle of the, of the technique by, by looking at the iron transition from, HP, from BCC, body center to HTPC. And uh, the first uses are coming uh, in the coming uh, months. This was the, the calibration uh, measurements. Another way to, to access to extreme condition is by static conditions using ambient cells. And this is the, the principle of the ID27, another flagship beam line for high flux nano X-ray diffraction uh, spectroscopy. And sorry, X-ray diffraction uh, technique, fully optimized for monochromatic high resolution XRD uh, at very high temperature and pressure. The, the, the beam line also has X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy and imaging, and they, they already got the first results it's in the next uh, slide. Here is a scientific, very important achievement is uh, uh, basically the, the phase diagram of water. And the key question to answer was, what are the physical and chemical state, uh, states of water, ice water under extreme conditions of temperature and pressure? Is there, is there solid or liquid, molecular, ionic, super ionic? This is just a substance where the, the oxygen are in, in a very important lattice while, well, a very crystal structure while the hydrogens are, are floating freely. So the measurements were done thanks to the EBS and the ambient cells. And basically, this has important applica implications not only for the planetary science, but uh, uh, the dynamics of, of planets like Neptune, but also implication for the magnet, the, the different, the different uh, structures. And um, was found basically a two structure. Uh, uh, water up uh, states and where there is a clear transition at high temperature and high pressure from PCC to PCC. And this was thanks to the to new capabilities of the uh, EBS. In the same way, another beam line, this is a spectroscopy beam line, uh, ID26 uh, dedicated to X-ray absorption and emission spectroscopy. Uh, the beam line has the possibility to, to uh, studied the X-ray absorption emission spectrum with high resolution thanks to the crystal spectrometer. And they basically uh, apply to catalysis, to air science, biology, materials, and uh, science and environmental science. And there is a very uh, recent examples on the use of the ID26 uh, crystal spectrometer to study uh, fuel cells. You know, fluid cells, they are already in use they convert chemical energy into electricity and they're already used in some cars from Toyota and Hyundai. And, but they're still very expensive. So the key question was whether it's possible to, to go for alternative uh, metals to, to replace uh, platinum. And there are some transitious metals like iron that can be embedded in carbon matrix to top it with nitrogen in order to replace the platinum cattle. And in that context, what uh, was uh, achieved thanks to the uh, measurement of the absorption spectrum of the, of the cattle was the possibility to improve the design of these four cells artificially by artificially aging process. And the, the message is that iron nitrogen carbon material should be designed in a way that the iron nanoparticles are protected by its shell. It affects the oxygen uh, or the ungraphene cell. 
So let's say to conclude, we, we can say that the SRF, uh, let's say, uh, a spectrum of, of research activities are very in line, much quite well with the trend in material science towards the, the ultra small and ultra far approaches. I mean, in temporal and in, 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 in spatial resolution. We are going to a smart material. We are helping the, the material scientists to, to design better materials with very customized and intelligent properties, you know, better uh, reacting to, to external stimuli, to, to, to the needs that we have. And in that uh, context, the ESRF play a key role as a four generation, high energy four generation machine, covering all the fundamental theories in terms of time scales and lengths. Uh, uh, making possible a uh, breakthrough. So right now there is a clear tendency to, to go for open-ended and thermodynamic conditions that allow to get the best from the materials. And in that sense, uh, if we just summarize in just a single graph, we can see that the fourth generation is, is actually targeting the study of dynamics of very embedded interface or, 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 or structures in, in full devices. And with this, I want to just thank you for your attention. And I open the question I don't know right now or, or later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for this brilliant, brilliant overview of physical sciences and the use of silicon radiation. We have some kinds of questions. Either from the audience with the physical presence or from a collective uh, audience. There is no question as far as I am. Yeah, as far as I see uh, in the chat, I don't see any raise of hands. Yeah, there is one question. Please. Thank you for your excellent presentation. What is the question? How many interactions do you have with this? Yeah, there's quite a lot, a lot of interaction. As a matter of fact, there's a BM18, which is a beam line uh, dedicated to material science, industrial activity, but also to biomedical imaging. I didn't want to step up, but we will see a presentation of, from Paul Taferon on the application of large uh, field high throughput uh, phase contrast tomography to different uh, examples. I mean, uh, in, in biomedical and in 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 uh, batteries activity, but I think that he will focus on on, on biomedicine. But I mean, most of the time the techniques are open not to a very specific area, but they are open to to many things. And there are some cases actually where you have a. I can, look, biomineral, for instance, for instance biomineral mineralization process. Right now, when you study biomineralization, you know that there are sometimes biological interactions with bacteria, that they are part of the business. So uh, both, even if we are split in two groups because of uh, organizational, let's say, purpose, the, the research is not, I mean, it's not close to, to one topic. Right. The question comes from Maria Cristina, a member of Cheers and Network from the National Research Center. Mm -hmm. So it's whether the uh, this interaction uh, goes down to the user level, so if somebody applies for for big time, or in particular a value study that they provide, then you suggest other options that the user might have by like using different technology than for sure. Time. I think that this is actually the way the SRF works. Most of the time, the user contact the scientists, and the scientists actually offer all the possibilities, not only a stick it, you know, to a beam line, but uh, just to increase the chances, and also to profit from from the different techniques. This is part of the, let's say, of the of the strategy of all the the, the, the beam line scientists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea that we have developed at the SRF for doing. Uh, the uh, last uh, 
decade is a structuring of uh, the real time applications, which really takes into consideration both uh, the beam line aspect and all the possible applications. So uh, uh, we make sure that uh, all the possible applications for uh, certain beam lines are, for, are, 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 are seen by animals that have the right expertise, both on the understanding of the beam lines capabilities and the science being proposed by, by the industry. Because it's a very complicated, you know, make a, either a, 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 a division only on science or on your beam line, because as you pointed out, many beam lines can touch upon a very different field of science. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And we're going to have, I think, after uh, Annalisa, who's going to give you the whole side view on the life science activities, then Joanne will give you uh, the user perspective. Our next speaker is Professor Alisa Mustafa, Director of the Institute of Science and Technology, Director of Hello to everybody. I'm very pleased to to be um, with you, even though um, virtually. Uh, let me just uh, put, okay. Um, and uh, uh, so you, you, you just heard uh, some of the fascinating projects that uh, take place at the uh, ESRF in physics. Um, I will, would like to give you a little bit of uh, flavor of what we do also in life science. Um, you certainly understand, uh, maybe repeat this because uh, it was difficult for, uh, for people on Zoom to, to hear properly uh, the last part of uh, the, uh, the, the, the question, say, of the last presentation. So you certainly realize that uh, uh, often the same B line can be used for uh, completely different purposes. And so the distinction between life science and, uh, and physics, life science, chemistry, and physics is, uh, is, uh, is very thin. And uh, the same um, B line can, can really fulfill completely different purposes. So uh, you've already seen this, uh, this nice slide that summarizes many of the things that uh, we do at uh, ESRF. And we really offer a, a huge range of completely different uh, possibilities and applications. And, uh, uh, and also there are quite a few industrial partners. So it's quite, quite important and, uh, and nice to have so many, uh, so many users. So today I'm going to give you a bit of uh, the flavor of uh, some of the um, uh, projects that uh, run on some of our uh, B lines. And then you will hear much more from individual scientists that are responsible for specific B lines. So let me just uh, start with, uh, uh, so our experimental division is uh, composed by six groups. And roughly speaking, three and three, three are, the, are uh, more or less uh, dedicated to life science and three are more or less dedicated to, uh, to uh, more physical uh, uh, applications. So I, I'm going to give you some examples of the uh, projects that we run on life science. And one of the, the very first project that I like very, very much is uh, the application of uh, um, combined uh, ultra small angle and wide angle scattering um, uh, facilities, methodologies to study muscle. And probably some of you know that uh, already since 1953, uh, many researchers have been trying to understand how muscle work and what, <clears throat> what are the physical uh, uh, and mechanical um, forces that dictate the contraction of muscle. And you understand that this is very important also for, uh, for uh, uh, one of the most important muscles that is uh, heart. Now, with uh, uh, at ESRF, we have uh, been lines that uh, are dedicated to the study of uh, 
of uh, um, uh, muscles and uh, the, uh, one of the applications and they, they uh, specifically um, uh, use uh, the, uh, the EBS, the extremely br brilliant source, because that has increased the capability for us to, to work. And so we, we are able to, um, to follow uh, how muscles work and uh, um, and we couple the uh, the uh, synchrotron radiation to uh, mechanical uh, forces so that we stretch muscle and we understand in, in real time how uh, what happens in, in the mu muscle fiber so this is a very important uh, uh, application and uh, uh, the same bin line has been used also to, for instance, to follow the uh, formation of the capsid in uh, viruses. So very, very different uh, applications. And, uh, and then we also can do um, time resolved measurements. And one of the, our bin lines, ID um, uh, 13, allows us to, um, to follow in, uh, in, uh, in a time resolved, uh, sorry, uh, ID uh, nine, to follow in a, a, a time resolved uh, um, way <coughs> how chemical reactions uh, happen. So there is a, a pulse that, uh, um, that allows the, um, the the starting of the reaction, induce the starting of reaction. And for instance, uh, one of the applications that, uh, that is uh, currently uh, going on is to, to study uh, proteins that are uh, bound to prosthetic groups that are light sensitive. So we start with, uh, with the light pulse, the, the reaction, and then we can, we can follow what happens during the reaction in a, in a time uh, resolved uh, fashion. And then, uh, of course, uh, what would uh, a synchrotron be if they were not also directly, directly uh, medically oriented uh, uh, applications? So one of our big lines is dedicated to biomedical imaging and radiation uh, uh, therapy. So it's a bin line that uh, uh, has uh, two uh, different applications. One is uh, biomedical imaging, and this uh, allows us to, uh, to understand the uh, etiology of uh, some diseases, uh, which can be asthma, osteoporosis, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, and so on. And uh, at the same time, so this is uh, really, uh, these are applications that are mostly diagnostic and for treatment. And uh, uh, another application of the same B line is instead in radiation therapy. And for instance, uh, um, one of the important applications of uh, uh, synchrotron is to, um, to treat uh, cancer um, in, a, in a very uh, specific and, and very uh, um, targeted way. So this is something that we are uh, very actively uh, progressing. And uh, now there are also, these have been lines that already exist, but then there are been lines that uh, are currently in, uh, um, in uh, construction. So for instance, one of uh, the, um, the, the, the latest uh, addition to uh, our future portfolio is uh, a, um, a bin line dedicated to coherent X-ray dynamics and uh, imaging. And this bin line will uh, um, allow us, for instance, to, uh, to study directly in, in the cell how molecular, uh, molecular um, uh, crowding uh, occurs. And uh, just uh, to, to, to make a little bit of uh, publicity, I will mention that we, we are uh, organizing a, um, a workshop that will take place in uh, Grenoble in, uh, a, at the end of uh, uh, June this year on new, new frontiers in molecu molecular crowding. And uh, so now let's move on to uh, a different group, the nanoprobe group that uh, is uh, essentially um, 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 studying 
different phenomena uh, using imaging, different types of imaging. And so several different applications again. One of the applications that uh, has been uh, uh, very interesting is uh, assessing the effect of uh, radiation damage on crystals. And this is, of course, very important for us, but also it's, it's important to, to understand the effects of uh, radiation. Uh, and then uh, some very beautiful, incredibly beautiful applications are in 2D and 3D imaging. And this is the, the, the work of, uh, that, that you will hear um, later on by uh, uh, Peter Clertens. And uh, it's really amazing how uh, uh, these techniques allow us to, for instance, uh, follow the distribution of uh, anti-cancer drugs directly in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the cell. And so there have been uh, some very nice uh, uh, studies that have shown that specific anti-cancer uh, drugs uh, accumulate in the mitochondria or in, in the endomembrane system. And uh, likewise, it's possible, uh, for instance, to study the effect of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, anti-malarian uh, drugs and understand how the, um, uh, they work uh, to uh, combat uh, malaria. And even more amazing are the applications of uh, nanotomography to neuroscience. So um, uh, th there is uh, quite a lot of work going on in, 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 in our institute uh, where we can uh, actually use uh, um, our imaging uh, uh, tomography uh, techniques to, um, to, to study multiple sclerosis or to study uh, diabetes or to study the, the uh, neuro uh, um, system in, uh, at the moment in Drosophila in the future in, in uh, human brain. And of course, uh, all this, uh, this is uh, possible um, mostly because of, uh, of uh, the um, incredibly high capabilities of uh, the uh, extremely bri brilliant so source. And, uh, and also you understand that this is th this imaging uh, techniques directly um, uh, relate also to what uh, both uh, Francesco and uh, Emma have already mentioned, so the possibility to, to look at uh, uh, incredibly small details uh, at very high resolution uh, at um, um, uh, tissues, cells, tissues, and organs at completely different uh, levels of uh, uh, magnification. And now just uh, a, a tiny little uh, ex example of uh, completely different uh, uh, applications for, for, uh, for the synchrotron. Uh, we also have a, a bin line that, it, that is mostly dedicated to cultural heritage. And on this bin line, we can, uh, for instance, study the quality of uh, pigments in, uh, in historical uh, important uh, um, uh, paintings like uh, Van Gogh or uh, Rembrandt. And we have uh, the possibility of uh, study the pigment and how the pigment changes in time so that we can also um, design um, um, uh, ways to preserve um, uh, art uh, pieces of, of art. And so now uh, just quickly I will mention the structural biology group that uh, of course is one of the uh, very important uh, uh, parts of, uh, of ESRF with lots and lots of uh, users every year. Um, um, uh, um, uh, Christophe uh, uh, later on will tell you much more, Christophe and Desai will tell, tell you much more about the structural biology group, which really offers unique possibilities to uh, users all over the world. We have uh, approximately uh, 10 B lines dedicated to this, and uh, they can uh, um, uh, tackle completely different aspects of uh, structure determination. Um, I will only mention a few things because, uh, it, because of uh, time restrictions, but uh, uh, the number of structures that have been uh, 
uh, solved uh, of a protest Russia that had been solved uh, um, thanks to uh, ESRF. ESRF is really amazing. It's uh, increasing all the time. And we, we uh, are now able to tackle also uh, big complexes and uh, extremely important uh, uh, systems. And later on, you will hear that uh, in addition to the standard uh, um, uh, synchrotron bin lines, we also have uh, now one bin line that is dedicated to cryo EM. So it's a cryo EM facility that is run as a bin line. And there will be another one uh, soon uh, that will also offer uh, access to, uh, to users. And uh, I also want to mention uh, um, the possibility to follow in, in time reactions at uh, the, the level of uh, crystals. So we have a, a bin line that is, uh, is uh, uh, going to, op to be open very soon. And that <coughs> offers time resolved crystallography. So the possibility of uh, uh, looking at reactions uh, in the crystal while they are happening. And finally, I just want to uh, mention two, two uh, crown jewels that I think are, are really a, an addition, an incredible addition to the whole portfolio of ESRF. And one is, so there are two uh, laboratories that offer in, in infrastructures. And so one is dedicated to uh, to um, uh, soft matter, and it's essentially uh, provides essentially uh, unique facilities for uh, the characterization of, uh, of uh, uh, samples, like uh, biophysical uh, characterization, and offers uh, uh, quite a lot of, uh, um, of uh, techniques. And the other, uh, the other la laboratory is uh, the uh, CBB, lab CBB laboratory that uh, is a laboratory for molecular biology studies. So that uh, is a, a way to, um, to link uh, the structural studies, for instance, with the functional studies of, uh, of uh, proteins. And um, uh, uh, so that uh, um, uh, protein purification can uh, can, can be done on site and also um, uh, cell cultures and cloning and uh, crystallization. And so with this, I terminate my, um, my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention and please do not hesitate to ask me questions if you have any curiosity. Thank you very much, Annalisa, for the excellent overview in life sciences. Um, next time, we'd we'll like to have you here with us, maybe in the near future. Uh, any questions from the audience here, please? Yes, Maria de Marogna. We need to get the microphone. So. Okay, I have a, a question regarding the proteins that are stimulated by light. Yeah. Um, uh, could you please explain uh, more? You add uh, these um, prosthetic groups artificially to the proteins? No, they, they are natural proteins that come from bacteria, and therefore they they uh, okay they, they are they, they naturally contain the prosthetic group, and the the whole pro process is activated by by light, so that uh, we can follow what happens during the the, the reaction. Okay, so it has not been uh, used for other proteins. Uh, I mean, uh, um, at the moment, uh, I, 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 I'm aware of uh, uh, this project that is in collaboration with the, the Institute of uh, uh, Structural Biology in, uh, in Grenoble. And these are proteins that are from bacteria and they are, they are natural proteins. Okay, thank you. Of course, you could apply the same concept to whatever, and I'm sure that there are applications in the pipe, pipeline. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience here? I actually, I'd actually like to ask for your perspective, your view regarding the future of structural biology in general, because there is a lot of discussion about crystallography and computer charging with other techniques. 
Okay, this is a beautiful, beautiful question that uh, we are actually um, debating ourselves at the ESRF. Um, I think that uh, our point of view is that despite of alpha fold, despite of uh, um, computational methods, structural biology has still a very long life. And in fact, what we are actually trying to do is to incorporate uh, the information from al al AlphaFold in our pi pipeline of uh, uh, structural solution. So that, for instance, uh, um, uh, predictions can, can support, can hel help us in uh, uh, doing molecular replacement. So the idea is that uh, uh, we want to integrate as many techniques as possible and work at uh, different uh, scales and uh, and, and this is also the same concept that we are implementing in imaging. Uh, also, the, um, the introduction of, uh, of um, uh, CryoEM at ESRF has been strategic exactly in view of having a different uh, perspective, a different possibility, an increased possibility to solve uh, even bigger uh, systems. And for instance, one of the applications of, of for us, of uh, future applications for us uh, in, uh, in cryo, yeah, in, uh, in structural biology will be, for instance, to solve uh, specific, um, you know, domains or, or subunits or whatever with X-ray and then use cryo -EM that, uh, that is, uh, gives its, its best with the large systems to reconstruct the whole system at a, 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 a full um, dimension. Yeah, I think you covered everything uh, about the future of structure and biology, which we all hope to be very young, to be honest. Any more questions from the connected participants? So actually, we don't have any. So okay. uh, yes, please. Uh, 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 the next question comes from Professor Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry, Christos Georgiou from the Department of Biology, University of Paris. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this is going to be on the case of uh, structural biology. Uh, how about the class you think is in the most developed right now? I uh, can uh, resolve structures in systems that are in vivo, for example, uh, structures, chronic structures, crystal structures that uh, form within cells, for example. Mm. That would be uh, maybe very interesting because uh, we do know that. Uh, uh, Forming the uh, vivo uh, crystal structure, structure is not mostly or not, not the same as uh, their structures actually being within an in vivo environment. Mm -hmm. the, the question refers to in cell crystallography, if mm -hmm. I understand uh, crystallization within the cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we resolve crystal structures within cells. Yes. Under the natural environment. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, I, I, I did, I'm not sure that I understood the, 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 yes. the question. Uh, the question I will try to help uh, refers to in cell crystallography. Proteins which are crystallized directly in cells, so the proteins are in their native environment. Yes, uh, I, I think we are uh, actually thinking of that. Uh, it's uh, um, many years that uh, I've been uh, trying to do the same thing, but uh, using a different technique, not crystallography, but uh, nuclear man magnetic resonance. So the idea is that uh, is to, uh, to, to gather the structure of a protein directly in the, uh, in the physical environment. Um, it's still I would say that there is still quite some work to, to, to be done, but uh, um, I think we, we can probably approach maybe not structural determination, but certainly 
um, characterization of proteins in their natural environment. And I think Christophe will, uh, will later on mention something on, 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 on this topic in his presentation. Yes, it is a uh, complicated field, but very, very uh, important, undoubtedly. undoubtedly. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa, for the presentation. If there are no more questions, uh, if there are no more questions, I think we can move uh, forward with the next presentation. Heidi from the ESRF, John McCarthy. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. You can? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, well, first of all, thank you, um, everyone. Thanks for the organization of this um, very um, exciting day and for giving me the opportunity to speak. So, um, I think this is the only non-scientific talk of the day, but it's definitely the most important. <laughs> so <laughs> my colleagues won't agree, but I'm telling you it's the most important. Um, so um, <laughs> hopefully um, I'll be able to give you um, enough information. There's a, it's a, there's a lot of information to give and, and not, a, a not a lot of time to give it. So I have um, a lot of information on the slides. I won't talk about all of it, um, but the, the idea is that we would then make these uh, presentations available to you. So I'd rather put more information on the slides than you have it, um, even if I don't cover it orally, okay? So the outline of the talk um, will cover some aspects of before the experiment, during the experiment and after the experiment, um, particularly about beamlines and the public uh, proposal types that we have, um, about the proposal rounds and proposal review, a few tips for writing good proposals. That's where I won't go into detail, but there's a lot of detail on the slides. But it's always useful. Um, some information about the kind of support that we provide um, during the experiment. And then uh, after your experiment, the obligations in terms of reporting and publications. So um, I think uh, this may have been mentioned earlier on, but you're not expected to see this table in detail, but there are um, 34 entities, I call them here beamlines, they're, they're funded in, in different ways, but there are 34 entities that are completely um, open to the public. Um, and those 34 entities include a cryo-electron microscope, three beamlines that are under construction. Um, and in total, there are 36 independent end stations running that are run completely by the SRF and 100% of the beam time available is available for the public user program. Then in the bottom table, we also have 13 private collaborating research group beamlines, um, and those uh, beamlines give us 33% as well of their beam time. So that constitutes the available beam time for the public user program. Um, there's a lot of beamlines, and so trying to find out which one you need, um, we have a, on our users and science web pages, we have, can I, can I put this pointer on? Uh, not in an easy way that I know how to do, so I'll skip that. I think you can see my mouse. So the, here um, on the Users and Science webpage, we have this section called Find a Beamline, and you can look up each beamline and read about it. You can look up by group, so for example, the Structural Biology group and see what beamlines are in the group. And there's also um, a database by techniques. So for example, um, can you see? Yeah, so you can put in different criteria like uh, the technique you're looking for, the discipline, um, or the. Um, I just not see. Um, by the beamline or by the energy, for example. And then there's also, um, uh, let's say, more European level uh, pages with information about our beamlines and about other, um, other European institutes on a site called Way for Light, where again, here, You've got, you can search by facility type, by technique and by discipline. So all of those things are set up to help you find the right beamline um, in the first place for what, you're, what you want to do. Um, we have three categories of proposals and users at the ISREF. So the one I'm gonna talk about today is the public peer reviewed proposals. Those are free of charge. And the obligation is that you must publish the results if, um, if the results are usable, of course. 
Um, we also have proprietary research proposals, um, which is purchase beam time with no obligation to publish. These two things both are con constitute, the pub uh, constitute the public user program. And then we have a private uh, path, which is for, for members of the um, collaborating research groups. So the user office, which I run, um, deals with the public proposals. And I think Ed, at the end of the day, will be talking to you about proprietary research. All of our proposals are submitted online um, using uh, our, our user interface, which is called the user portal. And here, for example, you can see on this page the different proposal types that are available today. The ones that are available for public beam time, there are four. Um, the standard research proposals, which is more than 90% of what we receive. We have long-term projects and specifically for structural biology at the moment, we have bags and rolling applications. Um, and when you submit a proposal, each proposal has a main proposer um, and, the, um, and co proposers And for us, the main proposer is really the, um, the, the, the unique contact point. So it's, that's the person who completes and submits the proposal and receives the correspondence and registers the users for the experiment. Um, just a short page on each. So standard ESREF proposals, which is what most people put in. There are two deadlines each year on the 1st of March and the 10th of September for beam time six months later. Um, you submit a single request uh, per project and you can request more than one beamline on each proposal and that proposal is valid for six months. So it gets beam time six months later or it doesn't. Reserve lists also exist. Um, and on the proposal form, there, there are two parts. There's an electronic form that you fill in online and then a project description form, which is a two page free text PDF document that you add to the, the electronic form. And as Francesco mentioned on the electronic form, um, we ask certain information that includes the scientific area, um, societal challenges, who the proposers are, the beam lines that are requested, um, the equipment requirements and beam requirements, sample data, etc. Long term, so okay, sorry, that standard proposals look like this. So this is the electronic part um, with the information as we give it to the review committee members, and then the two page free text document. So it's, it's quite a short document and it should be concise and, and standalone. Long-term projects, um, this is, so we have a, a long-term access program um, where we can, let's say, guarantee access on the condition that, that the results are, are coming out um, between one to three years. And there's an annual deadline for that on the 15th of January each year. There is an obligation that the main proposer has to be affiliated to uh, an institution in an ESREF member or associate member country. And here, um, there are some specific criteria for excellence apart from scientific excellence, which is, um, the contribution of, uh, of some financial, technical, or human resources um, to the ESRF during the duration of the long-term project, because the idea is that these particular projects, they're not only scientific, they're scientific, and they bring something to the rest of the ESRF user community. Um, so like a new technique or a new instrument. The structural biology, we've, we've had for, for many years now bag proposals, and it's something that we're currently trying to implement also for non-MX proposals. Um, we hope that we'll be able to implement something on that um, in an, on an official way next year. So with BAG means block allocation group and basically um, in structural biology there we, we block these groups uh, into mainly geographic areas. So one could imagine a Greek BAG where all of the um, structural biologists in Greece uh, combine to submit one BAG um, and manage the beam time between them. Because this status is awarded for two years um, with applications submitted once a year. There's reporting that has to be done after one year with a progress report and after two years with the full two year progress at uh, the full two year report, which corresponds to the renewal then of the bag status. Um, we have seven ESRF and one CRG beam line, which the beam time is distributed over. The allocated beam time is managed by the bag responsible. So we say here, Greek bag, you can have, uh, I don't know, uh, 15 shifts every six months and the, the community itself works out who who is going to use that time. Um, we have currently 54 of those in operation and potentially another 11 who have just applied to use the serial synchrotron crystallography new ID29 EBS beam line. Um, and these pictures basically show the advantage of a bag over standard proposals for this kind, sorry, for, for this kind of um, access, which is that instead of writing lots of individual proposals for short amount of beam time, um, we put all of the samples into one proposal um, and all of the principal investigators into one proposal. And it just means um, it's a lot easier for you to handle, for us to handle. And there's a much more efficient use of the beam time where you build, you, you set up, 
you take data on lots of samples and then you set down and there's a lot of uh, it's a lot more efficient for for structural biology um, groups that aren't members of the bag we have a rolling proposal system to ensure rapid access because of course when you when you get samples in structural biology you often need the beam time within weeks before they, they they're destroyed um and so um with this rolling application system proposals can be made anytime there's no deadline um, they typically request for one or two or three shifts on the MX beamlines on biosacs. They typically request for nine shifts on the cryo EM. And I think there'll be typically nine to 18 shifts on the new um, ser serial synchrotron crystallography beam time beamline. And there, the beam time is scheduled within six to eight weeks if the application is successful. So it's, it's really a rapid access. Um, now we come to a proposal round and submission deadlines. So there, as I mentioned earlier on, there are two submission deadlines per year on the 10th of September and the 1st of March. The 10th of September deadline is to apply for beam time the following year from March to July. And the 1st of March deadline is to apply for beam time starting at the end of August until February of the following year. Um, the beam time allocation panels, which are scientific, uh, our external scientific review panels meet at the end of October and the end of April. And we publish the decisions um, early December for the March beam time and early June for the August beam time. So the next deadline is on the 10th of September 2022, and it's for beam time use in, uh, from March to July in 2013. The proposal review is summarized in this slide. Um, the only two points I'll point out to you is in red here. There is a proposal submission between this step and this uh, red step. Francesco mentioned it, we do a preliminary check. So we give the proposals to all the beamline scientists and they check the scientific area and they check the, the beamlines requested um, and they can adjust. So if it's not appropriate for their beamline, they can move it at that stage um, or they can suggest even alternative beamlines. But we do, and I'll come back to that later, we do recommend that you discuss with the beamline scientists before even submit, submitting. Um, they want it, we want it, you want it. So it's really something that we want you to do and we recommend for you to do. So the evaluation itself, there's a technical evaluation done internally by the beamline scientist. There's a scientific and innovation and technology assessment that's done by our beam time allocation panel members. Those are external panels of external scientific experts. And then we have a safety review done by our own safety group. And um, all of that information is then made available for real meetings where the panels get together and they discuss all of the proposals and they make their recommendations. We do have as part of our allocation procedures, we have a country balance um, procedure, which takes in, tries to take into account whilst keeping the scientific excellence um, and the recommendations from the BTAP, tries to ensure um, a fair scientific return for the member countries and the associate member countries. Um, we do this by, we have 12 different panels and each um, panel reviews all of the proposals for a subset of beamlines. So for example, if you submit a proposal for ID1, it goes to C1. If you submit a proposal requesting ID1 or ID13, it will be seen independently by C1, who will review it for ID1, and C8, who will review it for ID13. Um, and on those panels, so there's 12 panels, there are 120 um, experts, um, including one from Greece, Irene, who's in the audience. Um, so she, she knows all about this, but uh, yeah, so there's um, these panels get together and they make the recommendations for us. The scientific research areas covered, um, there are 12 of them that are listed here, and you can see um, from this shifts delivered last year in 2021 that um, the, very, the, the big ones for us are chemistry, hard condensed matter, material science, and um, structural biology, but of course, um, and quite a lot of soft condensed matter science, and we have some cultural heritage, environment, engineering um, at, a, at a lower level, but we're able to report on it by identifying these scientific areas. A word on submitting your proposals. Um, this slide just shows you that the public interest in the ISREF is high. Um, we do receive, we were receiving before um, the EBS shutdown and then before COVID and before we created community access proposals, we were receiving two and a half thousand proposals a year of which we could accept nearly a thousand or around a thousand. Um, that number's reduced since um, we came back, partly because of COVID, but also because we introduced more community access proposals because the number of standard proposals was getting so high that we had to try to find solutions for that. But yeah, we're on the order of you know, 2000 proposals a year. So we get 1000 to 1200 proposals per call, which is a lot, um, so that might put you off, but we also accept four to 500 proposals every round. So there's a 40% acceptance rate. 
Um, so there is a good chance of, of, of acceptance, but the reviewers see a lot of proposals. So the question is how to make yours stand out. And in a nutshell, if all you remember are these three, um, four things, then, then you're sorted. So an excellent scientific or innovation case, it needs to be technically strong with a clear scientific plan, a clear experimental plan, well-written, obviously. I mean, it's a bit like writing a CV. You know, you have to be careful that you look like you've been taking care of it. Um, and it should be entirely self-contained because the reviewers have a lot of work. They can't go checking references um, necessarily. They need to find everything they want in the proposal. These slides, there's a lot of information on them, and I'm not going to go through all of them because I won't have time. But um, I would say um, if, you, if you check these slides afterwards when I send them to you, um, I'm not going to go into anything on this page in particular. I've already told you there's an electronic application form and a methods form. Figures are useful because you can say a lot more with figures than with, um, with words sometimes. Um, what is important is that only about 1% of our proposals, even less than 1%, are rejected. And, and in that case, it's for technical reasons, which means all of them could be done. They're all good proposals that could be done. And so we, we ask our, our committees to sort of to let us know for them which ones are the ones that could be done, which ones should be done, which ones must be done, um, and which ones are highlights. So of course, you have to make your proposal stand out and it has to be very compelling. Um, so what we advise is that it's geared towards research that's specifically benefiting from synchrotron radiation and that it's a very targeted case. If you say we want to measure this and, and we, we hope we might find something like this, it's a bit too vague. So it needs to be pre-characterization. We've already, we've already got this information, that information, and all we need now is the synchrotron measurement to get everything we need. Committees like that, highly targeted proposals. Okay. Um, Second point on this slide is important, consult the Beamline staff. I did mention it, but it allows you to write targeted proposals saying what Beamline you want, targeting your explanation for the Beamlines that you're requesting and, and, and requesting the right amount of beam time, giving a clear experimental plan. That All of that's really important. And the Beamline scientists don't mind, I, they're all very busy, but that's what they want you to do. They would rather have good proposals, well-written proposals, than afterwards be, be, be um, uh, giving poor technical evaluation on proposals that you submit anyway, okay? There are more um, slides on writing a good proposal at the end of the talk that I don't cover, but they'll be in the, in the version that I'll send um, that people can consult. So this is now, if you get beam time, um, the logistics wise is this is one slide. If you get beam time, we ask you to fill in an experiment registration form, which is called an A form. And it does all of these things. So it's an important form because it's what gives you access to the storage ring, it gives you a canteen card, it helps you sort out your travel arrangements, site entrance requests, etc., support laboratories, things like that. We, in terms of support for doing your experiment, we have um, we support three scientists um, in general for most experiments, with a few exceptions. Um, for the scientists that we support, the travel requests have to be made using our online system. Um, you don't book your own. Um, tickets unless you get prior agreement through the online system. We have an on-site guest house that has um, 133 rooms that are available for us. Um, 20 of those are twin rooms. So with COVID, we've not been using them as twin rooms, but only single, but potentially when we're in full capacity, we can um, house 153 users on site. Um, we have an on-site restaurant that serves meals days in the daytime, lunch, nighttime, and evening and weekends. Um, and now to the end of your of the experiment, um, there's a very strong obligation with public beam time to publish and report on what you've done. Some publications take a long time, or um, what you've what you've obtained in terms of data isn't enough to constitute a, a publication straight away. It is an obligation to submit an experiment report. It's a two page experiment report. It's a short thing. Um, the deadline is three months after the experiment, unless you're submitting it to support a new proposal, in which case you should submit it for the deadline so that every, all the um, reviewers can see it. Um, you submit them through the portal and they are public. So they're publicly available because they're public beam time. Um, there is a possibility to submit confidential reports via the user office if you want to give important confidential information in those reports to the reviewers, but you don't want yet it to be available and visible publicly. Um, the most important thing here, yeah, they're looked at by the BTAPs. So the, the beam time allocation panels, if the reports are missing, some of them immediately uh, uh, reject the proposal, others will downgrade it by a certain amount. So it's really important to submit these experiment reports. 
this is what it looks like. Huh? It's really, really simple. Um, there's some basic information and then a one and a half page free text document. Publications, you can see here our publication record for the last um, 15 years approximately. You are required to publish all successful results. Um, you have to upload them to our library um, database so that we know about them and can report on them and so that you can cite them in future proposals. Um, you also, we also now have um, automatic DOIs for experiment data sessions that you have to cite in your publication. Not necessarily the session DOI, you can also mint, manually mint your own. So if you want to mint the DOI with a subset of data sets, for example, you can do that and cite that in your publication. Um, on the proposal form, as I just mentioned, we do ask for the ESRF publications and the reviewers do look at that. So it's, and those you can only put on the publication form if they're in our library database. So it's really important um, to, to, to notify the library and upload your, your publication information into our library database. Um, yeah, I think that's enough just to say that they pay attention to it. And so if, if the publication isn't there, what they also then look for is the experiment reports. So both of those things are really important. And that's it. It's a, it's a very brief overview. Um, as I said, at the end of this, uh, of this presentation, there's another few slides. Um, and I'm open for questions um, if anyone has any. Thank you very much. Now, now can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes I can. Oh, excellent. Um, I was just saying that John McCarthy is a very important lady of the ESRF <laughs> and she knows about everything. Not possible. Not possible. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I heard that because I could. <laughs> she, she knows almost everything considering this uh, European infrastructure. So, any questions, please, towards John? Thank you. You're very sweet. <laughs> I have one. Uh, as we are currently trying, is is a little sensitive question. We're currently trying to participate to the ESRF. So, what are the chances for Greek researchers to have beam time prior to the country's participation? Okay. So, Greece right now, as a non-member country, has two possibilities to obtain beam time. One is by collaborating with ESRF member countries. Um, and the second is, if they are not collaborating with ESRF member countries, if the proposal is considered to be scientifically excellent enough and is scored high enough, um, then officially that time is given out of what's called management contingency time. Um, and this management contingency time is, is something then we, we, we used to get the directors to agree to it, but then the overall um, agreement is that if it's high enough scored, and it's in the top proposals of a beamline, as long as the usage is not too um, big and takes away too much from our own member country and associate member countries, then it could potentially go in. So the easiest way is to collaborate with member country. If it's not possible and if it's fully Greek, it is still possible to get beam time. But when we do our country balance, if it's at the limit, it would drop out. If it's at the limit under the cutoff, it won't go in. Whereas if it's a, if it's a member country, if Greece is a member country or associate member country, then it benefits from this uh, this um, country balance algorithm. So we should really try to succeed in participating in the institute. So all Greek researchers uh, would have chances to get beam time to have funding for three uh, members per experiment. Uh, am I correct? <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly. But still, exactly. it's worth collaborating with uh, other researchers from member countries in order to uh, get, have already some chances to get them. I think, I mean, it's good. It, it, it's a way of getting experience as well um, about, about writing pr pr proposals and using the facility. But of course, right now, if, if you collaborate with a member country and you, you would get, and you got beam time, if any of the Greek users wanted to come, of course, there's no financial support from our side. So um, becoming a member gives you the financial support. And also, um, yeah, there's also, apart from the beam time, there's also the effort that the ESRF makes with the member and, and, and associate member countries in terms of ensuring that there's a fair scientific return. Today, there's no obligation, of course, um, there would be an obligation to try to reach somewhere close to the level that you would be participating at. 
Um, and then also there's, there's the other aspects that isn't beam time related, like staffing um, and, and, uh, and I don't know, purchasing or, you know, contracts and things like that. So it's not, uh, yeah, it, it goes beyond even um, beam time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. There is one question from uh, the connected audience. Yes. Uh, so there is a question from the chat. Can you hear me? Uh, Maybe, Dr. Uh, McCarthy, can you hear me? Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Time schedule? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. So I have to transfer one question from the chat. It's from uh, Nikos Pinochis uh, Birkbeck College. Regarding the beam uh, time schedule, uh, can it be more flexible for all beam lines in the same style as in massive one? So um, for most beam lines, no, for the simple reason that the massive one has a fixed setup that stays there um, all year round. And so most other beam lines are multi technique beam lines. And so um, uh, and, and the sort of, let's say, the request from one proposal to another in terms of, let's say, temperature, pressure, um, conditions, uh, use of support labs, et cetera, et cetera, is something that means that it's very difficult to for the beamline scientist to not be able to set up a structured um, schedule, which is the most um, what's the word the most uh, the most efficient use of the beam time. For the MX beam lines, yeah, I see I see the comment. Yeah, so for the other the other MX beam lines, um, yes is the answer. Yes is the answer. I mean, uh, uh, all of the MX beam um, all of the MX beam lines. Uh, I don't say uh, cryo EM, uh, is I can comment if she wants to, and I don't say um, ID29, um, but for the MX and potentially Biosax beam lines, yes, potentially that's possible. Um, it's just that we, at the moment, that's done with Google, I think, for Massive One, um, and then there's a transfer. Um, there isn't, a, a, there isn't a, a smooth link between the Google um, schedule and our user portal. So we would have to develop that into our user portal to do it on a bigger scale than is currently done now in Massive One. Um, because what happens now is the Google, the Google um, uh, schedule is done for Massive One and a person here, um, Debbie Davison, who you might probably know, she, um, she has to transfer all of that into our user portal so that all of the invitations are updated. So that, and then of course, if somebody moves or changes that all has to be updated. So I would say potentially it's feasible um, but it would need some development in our user portal to do that on a larger scale than just for Massive One today, to, to apply it to all five, um, all four MX beam lines and one um, Biosax, we'd, we'd have to do a bit of development. Okay. I, I think, think MX Group would like that too. I, I think they would be for it too. Thank you very, very much for that uh, kind of information. Um, so if there are no any further questions, uh, right? Uh, let us all thank the speaker. I thank all the speakers of this session. Uh, we said I have named that before. To acknowledge all of our sponsors, donators, people who really support uh, uh, the meeting, mm -hmm. the hybrid and um, yes. okay, uh, uh, physical uh, presence. The University of Patras, CBL Patras, pharmaceutical company but, uh, directed by Cleomenes Barlos. Annelise, directed by Lefteris Klothakis and Sev Peloponisu Vitikis Alaras, Sindesmo Selenum Viamitano. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody.